A huge welcome to BlogSub and to today's Science Talks. We're here today live from Copenhagen, as usual, from the co-working space and innovation hub. My name is Jule, I'm coordinating the science program here in BlogSub, and I'm hosting this year's series of the Science Talks. Today, we actually have the last of the series of the Leave No One and Nothing Behind this year, and I'm very glad that we have Ken visiting us today from the UK. But before we'll dive into the science talk of today, I just want to thank our partners for this year's series, which you might know if you have been following the series, is the UIA and the World Congress of Architects, which hosted a congress here in Copenhagen this summer. And the congress theme was Leave No One Behind, which is the universal value of the sustainable development goals. And we have kind of taken over that theme since we are also collaborating with them, but we've added a bit of a twist because instead of only leaving no one behind, we also want to leave nothing behind. But I think I'm just gonna now shift my focus to you, our special guest today. So Ken Webster flew in for us from the UK, which we are very happy to have you here. And he's a thought leader and expert within circular economy. He is now a visiting professor at Cranfield University in the UK, amongst many other, I'm only gonna mention that. But he used to be head of innovation at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation from 2010 to 2018. And from what I understood, you played also a very big role in formulating the narrative around circular economy, how we understand it today. He's also author of many interesting books, amongst other, um, the Circular Economy, uh, Wealth of Flows, and The Wonderful Circles of Oz. I can very recommend that. But now I'm going to shut my mouth and leave the stage to you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, very helpful, and always I feel very pleased to be in Copenhagen. I've visited many times, and if anybody says, oh, you might have to go to Copenhagen, I think, great. I like it. And this, drawing into this first, first slide, is something from Denmark. Ida Auken, a politician, I believe, I hope I pronounced her name right, she wrote a, a little scenario about the future in terms of a circular economy in 2016, which um, the World Economic Forum picked up on. And the core of it was, in the future, you won't need to own anything, but you'll be happy. Right? This idea that we don't need goods so much as services. But unfortunately, it turned into a dark meme because you can see the darkness in it. You will own nothing and you will be happy. And the question comes out in that one, or it's implied, who owns the stuff if it's not going to be you? So that is just a little example about how something that was meant just to illustrate possible futures can get worked around to, to reveal a darker side. So I'm going to entitle this talk under the, uh, the general heading provided by you. Uh, is be careful what you wish for, if I, if I had to, to say that. We will get into social justice, we'll get into circular economy, and how things really do work, or might work. Uh, the books have been mentioned, there's just a bit about me, but I'm very pleased to be involved with Earth for All, which is a Club of Rome's 50-year anniversary report, uh, and it's in uh, a survival guide for humanity. It's very much about solutions and possibilities. Uh, I was invited to write some thing within that, and they did say you won't be on the cover. That's okay, I'm not important enough, but to get some ideas shared was well worth it, so very happy to be a co-editor and contributing author to that one. And I think that's where I want to come in about ideas. Do you really need to be recognized for ideas? If they're being shared, isn't that reward enough? When it came to originally formulating the current interpretation of a circular economy, it was clearly derived from things like cradle to cradle, natural capitalism, biomimicry, the performance economy from Walter Stahl. But what I offered to the incipient Ellen MacArthur Foundation was I can shape this into a narrative that might be more able to be picked up by policy and business. Do you want to give it a go? 
and the, and the MacArthur Foundation did very much get behind that, added their own layers of things. But it shows the importance of a narrative. That, can you grasp this? And in fact, even stealing the term circular economy from the Chinese at that time, uh, they were the ones really using the term circular economy. It originally, you know, if we go back far enough, you can talk about Germany in the 1990s and so on. But the Ellen MacArthur Foundation picked up on, let's borrow the term because it's serious. It's circular, that says it's not linear, and it's an economy which is serious. We also promised not to talk about sustainability. Interestingly, we had long discussions about that to start with. And the reason was that ideas are framed around the language. If you talk about sustainability, ideas in mind come about with personal responsibility, guilt, uh, morality, all very important things. But if you're trying to move business and policy, it's much easier to truncate that and say, this is about economic innovation driven, sorry, about an economic opportunity driven by innovation, which spins off social and environmental benefits. But that had to be a compromise, it was my fault if you want to blame someone, which was never meant to just stay as it was, it was meant to introduce ideas and then move on to expand them. What does that say? This is about how we understand things, you know. Even for English speakers, this is a bit of a trick to start with. We don't understand things word by word or letter by letter, do we? We grasp the whole. This says the reconstruction of the world. And we do that, or in English, if you're fluent in English, you pick up bits throughout it, you read the whole thing or try and re read it. And then things, patterns come to mind. And so meaning isn't derived step by step. It, we try to grasp things as a whole. Now, what are we trying to grasp? Let's have a look at the economy a little bit. And this is Martin Wolf, a famous uh, Financial Times commentator. Well, you can read it there. He, he made a very important point is that what we seem to have at the moment is an unstable rentier capitalism, a word that not many people use, rentier, weakened competition, feeble productivity growth, high inequality and an increasingly degraded democracy. The sign on the building, the projection on the building says, we will not go back to normal because normal was the problem. Now this was done during COVID and in fact we did pretty much go back to normal. But so many people discuss the economy as though it's just a bit not quite right, but it'll be fine as though it was the end of history, that things are generally just fine, but we need to tweak things. Maybe they're not. Now, what drives this machine? Here's a linear e economy. What drives it? Now there's a big white guy in charge and there's people of different colors. It seems this is the artist's interpretation being fed into this globalized linear economy. But what's driving it? Any thoughts? I know we do questions down to the ends, but it'd be, be great. <coughs> Madam? It seems like it's consumerism. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's one, one take you could have on it. Consumerism, yeah. You got, you got the bo bottom left there. But what's enabling the machine? I mean, consumerism helps because then you have a big demand for lots of stuff. But it takes something else in particular. Oh, probably just state the obvious, it shapes, takes cheap energy. Cheap energy frees up materials and it takes cheap energy, but something else as well, which we'll come to in a moment. And so the linear economy is about converting all these other capitals, social and uh, environmental capital, into financial and technical capital. So it's not so much just let's make stuff, it's about degrading natural and social capital and making it into uh, financial capital, which technologists believe can just be then reapplied to fix ever, whatever we want. And I heard a story, you know Thelma, Thelma and Louise, the film, you know, they drive off the, the cliff. Most many people have seen that one. And it, it compared our technological approach to having driven off the cliff and then imagining we can invent a parachute on the way down to save us. That's in a way what, you know, technology is the answer. What was the question? 
You know, in fact, in the 1970s in Britain, there was the, these badges you could get, technology is the answer. Yeah, what was the question it was supposed to be fixed? And we, sometimes we ignore what the question should be. So, so is this the circular economy? Nope, it certainly isn't. Is this the new context for innovation? What's changed? Well, you've got slightly lower growth. <laughs> you've got slightly less out the back end and slightly fewer resources in the front end. And uh, Michael uh, Browngart, one of the originators around cradle to cradle design said, the problem is less bad is not good. And I think that's very important. You can moderate what we're doing and then you can call it what you like. But a circular economy, it's more like, oh, we've got a more efficient linear one. Uh, so that's perhaps not the systemic design and purpose that many people imagine we should have. Okay, fair enough. Now this just touchy, I'm not going to do uh, circular economy detail, you know all that one. But let me get to the top right. This is what is usually assumed underneath. This can help you if you're ever asked to say what it's about. It's about maintaining capitals. Right, it's got two cycles, the biosphere and the technosphere. Order is rebuilt in the left-hand side through living systems or managed living systems. On the right-hand side, it's by human ingenuity or effort. So, but the idea is everything is food for the system, including carbon dioxide, according to uh, Epeyer and Dries and Somner in Germany. And it's uh, done by design. Too many people think about the circular economy as waste management and recycling. <sighs> That's just linear economy tweaked. It's a serious legacy problem, but it's not what we mean at all. So, and a shift to renewables and energy efficiency, okay, things like that in there. Again, it's not saying anything about uh, the social context. So let me just dig back into this economy idea. It's the really simple, primitive schematic. You know, you see this in 101 economics. You've got producers, consumers, and government. Hey ho. And um, money sort of oils the transactions. Governments are like households. They try and balance their budgets. Markets allocate resources through free and fair competition. Well, and governments assist where there is market failure. This is a, a very crude representation. But part of the crudity came from Paul Samuels. Here he is, the textbook writer. He was trying to work with a bunch of engineers. And he imagined the economy more like a central heating system, if you like, pipe work. And um, you notice how savings, uh, investment leads, savings leads to investment, taxes lead to spending, imports and exports, well, they should uh, approximately add up, but if you can do more exporting than importing, that's good. So we got the idea that investment comes from savings via banking. And um, those things I mentioned. However, almost none of this is true. See, this is the stickiness of ideas. Uh, does investment come from savings? Really? Banks lend money on the basis of whether they think you can repay it. It doesn't say, oh, we've got three million kroner in the bank, we can lend three million kroner out. They have no restrictions like that. They don't depend upon the savings to make loans. They type it into your account based on the idea that the market feels good, the collateral seems okay, or we just believe you. They know that in the end, the central bank can bail them out or give them extra funds. So investment isn't needed necessarily via savings. It can be, investment can be created without savings or without many savings. Uh, governments are not like households. They don't have to tax before they can spend. Where does that idea come from? Governments are like banks. If they've got their own currency and they're reasonably secure, so I'm talking my country, your country, they can decide. They always spend before they tax anyway. And if most of that debt is in the hands of your own citizens or one's own citizens, there's not really a problem because countries are not users of the currency. They're creators of the currency. So they can, with you know, goodwill, decide 
what is available and where it goes. Imports and exports will leave too. But markets, it's a free-for-all competition. It isn't really free and fair for all at all. It's who's got the power in the market uh, usually shapes it. Now, I've got a couple of things to say about that very quickly. But to sum it out, here we have a perhaps too complex diagram, but it's got two elements in it which are really interesting. Finance and real estate and monopolies. Michael Hudson and others, Dirk Bessemer from Holland says, actually, two sectors dominate the economy these days. They are finance, finance, insurance and real estate are the, 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 the acronym he uses, the FIRE acronym. They dominate. Now, part of the reason why, as you can see on the right-hand side, in the 1950s in America, the size of the finance sector was approximately the size of the industrial sector. But today, finance is five times as big as the industrial sector. And um, those are who dominate. And money is created in two areas, either, as we've illustrated, through private money creation or through governments. And the missing thing from the diagram I had earlier about the economy is cheap money along with cheap oil. Here's the amount of debt flowing around at the moment. It's something in the region of three times the size of global GDP. If you don't think finance dominates, you only have to look at that. It's largely financed through debt, and it's largely built on cheap energy. So anybody who says, let's fix the material cycle, and says, I'm not going to talk about money, except as finance for investment or something, is crazy. You've got to fix the money cycle at the same time as you fix the material cycle. Otherwise, you get what happened in um, China, whereas they poured, I think, the equivalent to all that the Americans poured in terms of concrete in the 20th century. They poured between 2019 and 2022 the same amount of concrete. They went absolutely crazy for building things. And at the current time, Reuters says they have 68 million um, surplus apartments. They have an additional 20-odd million unfinished or partly finished. They have enough to house at least the population of France. And many uh, purchases of apartments in China don't just have the one. They have two or three. It's because it's where you put your wealth. They have high-speed trains to nowhere in a sense that there's no real business case for some of the places high-speed trains went. In other words, it was an investment-led boom that used masses of materials, lifted standards of living, but has got to a situation where it's almost, we just got to keep going because we don't want to risk the task the, of dealing with what happens if this turns down, which it has turned down now. And here's market concentrations. This is mostly America. Top four, 96%. Top four, 92, 94, 94, 93, 93. There isn't real competition in these sectors, at least. It's dominated by the top four or five firms. So that's not really a market thing. That's people able, because they control aspects of the market, to extract economic rents or unearned surplus. And then we tie in a little bit back to the circular economy. You see quite a lot of reports around looking at products as a service. We came in on that thing with, the, in the future, you will own nothing and you will be happy. I'm going to draw an obvious conclusion in a minute that these two things are linked. Uh, the state of the economic world and where we might be headed with a circular economy. You see, if you had, this is a report from Systemic, around emissions reductions if we move more towards service, for instance, equipment as a service or white goods or cars, whatever. It looks, it looks pretty good. I'm not, not denying that. It helps with emissions. And the size of the potential market is, so they claim here, fortune business, huge. So what? Well, if the circular economy starts making really good sense to these people, because this is part of a circular economy thing, are you going to get lower prices? Are you going to get more choice? I don't know. It may be that the circular economy, and here's it to add in some platform stuff, the circular economy fits very nicely with a rentier economy. 
In other words, it's dominated by finance, and fire, finance insurance and real estate. It's not about free and fair competition. It's about free for all dominated by a few firms. Here's the platform thing. Remember at one time we thought Uber was about sharing your car. I remember that sort of discussion in about 2012 or some 13 or something like that. Oh, you can use your car and do a bit of Uber work in the evening. So it's helping use resources more rationally. Didn't turn out like that, did it? This was, these are all bids to be monopolies in their particular sectors. Uh, Uber doesn't, you know, 10 years later, it's only just making some profit. It's like, let's burn money for 10 years in the hope that we can be in pretty much monopoly situation. Really, that's really good. Airbnb, similar, Facebook, Alibaba. So these become platforms which extract value. You know, there's uh, food delivery things. Restaurants pay up to 30% cut to the platform to enable it to happen. Uh, I have a book, it's available on Amazon. I found out that they set the price. The publisher can't set the price. Because if it's done through Amazon, they do a deal with Amazon, and Amazon has the right to adjust the price. So I see my book, price being adjusted, and I can do nothing about it. If I withdraw it from Amazon, well, I haven't got a platform. The small publisher that did it doesn't have a big platform. So the 30% goes to Amazon. It doesn't even go to a local shop. They take that. So this is really, I think, serious business. Because imagine with books, they're mostly print on demand now. They don't indulge in printing, so that's saving resources. But you didn't get cheaper books. You've got more expensive books unless they're in the top sellers where they can calculate through the algorithms that they make more money through selling volume. So maybe we have, I'm painting a picture, which is, I hope you'll dive back in on, perhaps plenty of room to disagree in places. But let's get into the theme about what else could be, what else could be, how we could approach this in terms of social justice and so on. It looks like all of those ones on the left reinforce each other. We have extraction, large scale enclosure, you know, accumulate the takers, the rentier finance, and money is a store of value. What about the other side? And do we need to rebalance it? Well, you might say yes, intuitively. But there's other reasons we should rebalance it. And part of it is the, the structure of systems. We know very well now that almost all real world systems are complex systems, feedback rich systems, interdependent systems. But many, many of them have a similar structure internally. Uh, this is always a balance, it seems. This was done originally for banking. Uh, it's an interplay between efficiency, streamlining, very few nodes, and resilience, which is made of many nodes. And there's a window of vitality, says Sally Gurner and others, where surviving, you know, thriving operators in that system, organisms, whatever it is, they have an effective system around the interplay between efficiency and resilience. Let's give a real picture of this. Here's some lungs. Effectiveness is doing things, uh, sorry, efficiency is doing things right, doing them faster. But effectiveness is optimize the whole system. Transform, retain, and maintain system fit. Gunter Pauli, a big writer and activist in this uh, arena, says the first and foremost role of the rule of the game needs to be changed from a shift to a sh shift from ever lower cost to ever higher generation of value with what is locally available. Now, why, why is this interesting or powerful, potentially? I would argue, it's, uh, this is an example of, of such a business, I'll just go back. Why is this powerful? Because if this is system structure in most complex adaptive systems, which are related to flow networks, what's been missing for us is a true attendance to the resilience end of things, to the multiple nodes and redundancy. If I get a, a blockage in my bronchial tubes, game over, probably. If I have some damage to some other parts of my lung, I'll, I'll be not very well, but I may get through it. And the same thing is with economic systems. When they become too brittle, they suddenly collapse. Whereas if we want an effective, long-term economic system that can take the knocks and changes, because we discovered in COVID, didn't we, that, oh, there are only two firms making this component. Mm, shit, what should we do? Excuse my French. 
What should we do? Oh, we can't do anything because it's just those two firms and one of them is in Thailand and flooded. You know, this has really happened. Some drugs went off the market effectively because some component was made in just one factory in the world. So we don't want that because it's asking for trouble. And it's not real. Real world systems are effective because they work at all scales to maintain the organism, to maintain the ecology. You can think of forests, whatever you like. Just to give it a practical example and also a little bit of a joke because Gunter Pauli worked with somebody in Argentina about transforming their economy. Argentina's in a real mess at the moment, but at least it was a discussion. This is what the, he called 3D ocean farming. It happens in um, places like uh, Long Island, New York, where the farmer doesn't, or the ocean farmer, if you want, doesn't go for one thing. They go for many cash flows from the same piece of water using the whole column of water. I talked to a farmer who said, I've stopped thinking about output. And I thought, really? No, I'm thinking about profit per hectare. I have a different approach to what I grow and harvest, and it involves multiple cash flows. So that's a, an idea of thinking rather differently. I've summarized it below. Economies of scope are economies of externalities in a way, or many, many firms like independent coffee shops, they're all doing roughly the same thing, but it's not about making that a super Starbucks or something, it's about enabling many more of them, add value with what we've got and so on. Well worth looking into Gunter Pauli because he's talking about resilience. You don't have to read all of these, this is just another element that brings us to the difficulties at the moment. This is ex-tax who wants to say we cut down the tax. Why are we taxing people? Really? Don't we want to tax waste and resources or non-renewables? It seems mad and they, they've just illustrated some scenarios that in Europe uh, they could do an equivalent tax shift which would take some of the burden off from people and put it onto waste and resources. It's not as though some of the solutions aren't there. Oh, let's shift where taxes fall. We could, we could gather the same amount. But why do we tax people? When we can, uh, well, part of the reason is that many of the non-renewable resources are owned by very few people. And to tie into some of this, uh, our other fixes for a circular economy is this idea that who is responsible for the product in the end? If you're in the linear economy, you make it, sell it, and forget it. Municipality tidies it up, charges the people to tidy it up. But what if there was extended producer ownership? So at the end of life, there was obligation for the original manufacturer to take it back. They would sooner just, says this report, uh, Paul Eakins is very good on this, at UCL, they would be able to uh, circular economy um, businesses will be able to compete more easily with linear ones because the responsibility for the products, components and material is identified as the manufacturer. Rather than just saying, oh, we'll just let consumers and municipalities deal with it. And if it poisons a few people, well, they may chase our, chase our backs for this, but we'll duck around it. So we could logically look a little bit better and we could also change ideas about, and this gets more into the social justice thing, about how we use resources overall. Uh, in my work with um, the Club of Rome, Earth for All project, we've talked a lot about a universal basic dividend. It's a form of income, but it's derived from fees for users of a commons. In this case, it's the atmosphere. So instead of just, oh, we've heard about carbon taxes, and it's in the news again, this is the idea you charge as high up the supply chain as possible for these things. Prices for fossil fuels and carbon intensive products increase and then they become climate friendly products become more competitive. But this is the really interesting thing. Revenues, it's a fee dividend system. They're distributed among citizens. Well, it's a quite a simple idea, but they add in another thing. This is Peter Barnes's work in particular. He says, a bit like the Alaskan Permanent Fund, these fees don't go to government in a sort of naive way. They go to a citizen's wealth fund. Norway has something similar, uh, but calls it differently. And unlike Norway, these are then distributed straight back to all the citizens. 
Well, why does that help? Because A, it puts spending power in these people's pockets and these poorer people are not the ones who are causing the most emissions. Which is a key point here. Otherwise, carbon taxes, carbon taxes always end up with you're going to really damage the poor. But you can do a systemic fix like this, which would at least at the minimum compensate them for the higher costs and incentivize more conservation-minded production and consumption. Just very quickly. Right, so what you have in the end, and this I'm just illustrating a couple of systemic changes, is that you have a real world there where Rontier's finance are in charge. One way of dealing with it is to charge uh, fees on non-renewables, on the commons like the oceans, like the atmosphere, and feed it through a wealth fund, supported by whatever the government wants to do, and feed it directly back to citizens. And the left like it because it's social justice. The right accept it because it's going to individuals, not into the deep well of government spending. So it, it achieves something there. And it's very practical. You see where the money is coming from and where it's going. So the question is, can we move to a circular economy that is more, this is from Kate Rayworth, is less about centralized circularity here to more about distributive circularity where there's a thriving business network around adding value with what we've got. There is also a distributive element to it where the economic rents earned on this side are transferred directly to the people. That's it. Okay, there we go. I did it fairly speedy so we can get time for the really interesting bit, which is your questions. Exactly. And I think I didn't mention it before, but of course we will have some time now for Q&A. And I've recently practiced a little exercise for you guys to now take a small breath and get to know the neighbors where you're sitting and for you guys online to maybe formulate a question and write it in the chat. And you guys in the room, you can just do some networking and maybe reflect on Ken's talk and also see if you have some questions coming up. And then we'll come back in a minute and then start the Q&A. Yeah. Okay, guys, I think we should start with the Q&A. You also have time to do some networking afterwards with some drinks, but I think now let's come back to the room and to Ken. So is there some rooms, uh, questions or reflections in the room? I think we have a microphone as well, don't yes, we? Yes, yeah. exactly. Otherwise, I'll just point someone out. Ah, perfect. My name is Lene Dammenlund. Um, I was wondering why you think uh, the money should be distributed to the people directly and not to the government. Mm. Because uh, don't we need solutions like central heating, for instance, that the individual cannot uh, yeah, come the, up with? Yeah, sure. The, I started this challenge with one of framing, you know, and trying to position things so that something gets done. Now, that last point I made about there's some tension between those who think the individual is more important, but perhaps in a more collective society like Denmark, there's, there's more a sense that perhaps we do things for each other, fairness and support. So you're quite right, we could do it that way. You could do a version of what they call universal basic services, which might be to have a, a warm home. It's guaranteed and done that way through collective action. You could also have things like... Um, just a universal basic income is not tied just to um, use of resources. Those are, those are real choices, of course. The, the reason that the Club of Rome Earth for All group took on basic dividend as a particular angle was it has a cleanness to it, if you like. These are unearned incomes from exploiting the commons, and they're given as unearned income 
to the other co-owners. You know, we're all co-owners of common resources, and so there's a nice transparency, so people can't get on a high ground and say, well, when we give money to the government, this much is wasted, this much goes to projects I really don't agree with, you cut out that one, or how come they get their central heating done and, and I've been waiting three years? You know, it's a lot simpler, in, in our view, to say, we make this clearly uh, a matter of ethics and natural justice, take those economic rents, as fees, you have to pay fees if you're using this common resource and give it to the other co-owners. That's why you can work it many ways. You know, some people prefer a, uh, um, a, a jobs guarantee scheme, for instance. Okay, we'll take money in and we'll guarantee it so there's jobs for everybody who wants one. So job guarantee scheme, universal basic services, variations on that. And my view is just that there's something clean about doing it as a basic dividend. You know where it's coming from, for why, and it's harder for firms to say, I'm not playing with that, because it looks like another scheme just to get money into the government. No, it's not going to the government, other than admin expenses. It's, it's going back to the people. So that's why. So lots of avenues there. You can crack that nut, as they say, in different ways. But the one I've illustrated is a basic dividend one. That was a great question. It's, uh, it's part of that debate at the moment. Madam. Um, yes, my name is Meta Tolling. I come from the Technical Academy. Um, and um, I'm wondering how do you, um, we can always debate whether your solution is the best or, or not. Uh, I also have some, some questions to that. But um, I'm more thinking about how do you even get to that point where you actually make that drastic decision. To, to change uh, some basic fundamentals in our economy. Yeah. And uh, so um, I was wondering if you can point out some central actors who can uh, drive this change. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I'm going home now. I can't answer that one. <laughs> no, but my perspective on this is that what we're short of in terms of a progressive future, frame it as you like, is not, these are the problems, but somebody be able to more coherently say, here's what we should do. Now you have said in Argentina, since you mentioned that, another typical strong guy, uh, right wing shift, arch libertarian approach in Argentina. I'm gonna take a chainsaw to the public services. We're gonna use the dollar. But what were the other side offering? You see, that's my point until We've been too busy identifying what the problem are. We're not very united on saying, we want this. We're, we're good at saying the problem, but we're not good at saying what we actually want. And some people will say, well, I want more public transport. And I go, oh, really? You know, that's not a big idea. It's almost as if the center and the left concentrate on just technical solutions to improve the welfare of some people. They don't talk about economics. Not in Britain, they don't so much. It's like, we're not as bad a party as you, rather than saying, we have got these new ideas that we really want to explore. Until, this is Yanis Varoufakis and others in the, in the European context say, um, we're very good at saying what we don't like, but we're not good at saying what we are for, in a way that catches the imagination of citizens. So that's why... I really can't answer it in a way I don't know, because Walter Steierhill, a big circular economy guy, said, I like your summary, Ken, but who are the people shouting for this? And he knew, he knew the answer was, not a lot of people. So that's why I said I might just go home at that point, because there's no established body yet or group of people who really think uh, in this direction. It, it, it's variations float around universal basic income and stuff but it's more technical solutions to practical problems. When I think the gap for progressives in the center is, what's the new idea? Otherwise you're leaving it to the right wing who have got a clear idea. It's bonkers, but they've got an idea. It's about retribution. It's about protecting my gang. It's about riding on top of laws and doing what we think is right for our group. That's, that, to me, that doesn't work very well. 
not in terms of democracy at the very least. So, great, fantastic question, a showstopper question. <laughs> I, will, I will say that. But moving quickly, quickly on, as the comedians say, moving quickly on, has anybody <laughs> got uh, other things that they'd like to, to bring out, perhaps as clarification or uh, other challenges? Or have you, <laughs> you've encapsulated everybody's uh, uh, reservations. Hi, and first of all, thank you for a really nice talk. I'm not sure I understood everything, but uh, it was really interesting. My question is around a data economy, and um, because it seems to me that for all of this to to happen or this transition to, you know, be possible at all, uh, there some sort of data economy infrastructure must be there, and that poses a whole lot of new challenges yes. and uh, yes. questions around privacy, ownership, yeah. surveillance. Yeah. So I just wanted to hear your reflections about that whole, D yes, so which I think is very much part of this. Uh, it is part of this. Transition. That's one of the very big dangers. There's a, a very significant book called uh, Surveillance Capitalism, which is doing the rounds at the moment, very, to treat that very seriously. But as you're quite right, if we don't know where things are made, how they're made, what's in them and where they're going, you can't do something like this reasonably at all. Because if you're just having a guess about what's in things, like I work with the Madasta Foundation, a materials database for the built environment. I'm on a supervisory board, it's set up in Holland. They're building a register of what's in buildings because it helps us know what we can get out of the building in terms of different materials. It's crucial. Now they're having their own struggles with maintaining the, the privacy element and uh, the, make sure it's accessible, all of these things. And whether there is, you know, the possibility that it could be a new commons. Can everybody get hold of this data? Circularize, also another uh, uh, Netherlands business, they're looking at using, they're using blockchain quite effectively to enable different people in the value chain to get information that's relevant to these questions without compromising IP. Even in the Madasta one, we, the board, a supervisory board, we have the metadata, we own that or control that one to make sure it's used well. So there are different people exploring how to square this circle around, around surveillance particularly and control. And the more we move towards central bank digital currency, it's almost like already I don't buy Danish notes when I come to Denmark, it's all on the card. So people are knowing what I've bought and where I've bought it completely. Denmark is still one of the few places where I don't need to change any money. And that's already me giving away data about what I spend and why. Well, we can guess the why perhaps, and three bottles of wine. That's probably something to say. So not solvable, but at, you know, on an immediate look at, but it's crucial to enable a circular economy and one that would distribute effectively, I would say. Now that's a nice political problem to deal with. It's like, we're going in this direction. How do we make sure it, it reinforces democracy rather than degrades it? But we're not gonna be managing to do this shift without it, I would make that claim. It's gotta come along in some form. And I would also say, yes, we ought to keep cash as well. You know, it's not everything should be open to continual scrutiny. Or what happens sometimes in China, if you're in a dispute, they can just make sure you can't access your bank accounts. You know, your social credit disappears. You can't even take some forms of train journey if you've been flagged as a malcontent. We don't want to go down that route. But, you know, again, there have been really good questions here. I'm sorry that I can't sort of say, oh, well, you just do this and then it's all sorted. But it's nice to have these real live challenges which connect through to the politics and questions of surveillance and so on. But it's going to be different if we want a different future, you see. Otherwise, we're back to where I came in is that we think somehow it's just all right, we need a few tweaks. I don't think it's all right. Yes. Things are looking very, very uncertain indeed. And we're sort of drifting into it, thinking, well, basically, we're nice people. Hmm. And I'm from the UK, which is getting a bit nasty at the moment, you know. It's very strange politics going on. So keep away from that. Uh, 
Next. Uh, uh, follow up. Well, you, you seem to be quite. Uh, yes, <laughs> so, so where where do we? I mean, do you see any signs anywhere in the world? I mean, locally, where you see a sign of this transition taking place in you know city experiments around the world, where you can see, okay, this is actually moving in the right direction. Well, there is a lot of movement at the meso level. You know, cities, municipalities, Amsterdam's doing great things with you know donut economics. They're exploring that. Um, Portland in the USA is famous for having initiatives. I think the focus on the meso level, like Barcelona is well known as, and Copenhagen, you know, is in that, is often mentioned in that mix. I don't know the local details. So cities are a great place for a lot of this activity to be experimented with. But it still doesn't solve the, the national problem. And even with basic dividend, people I work with called equal rights say, well, what about all these um, dividends from carbon emissions? What about some of it going to the majority world? Now, it's all of you northern folks. You've caused the problem. What about compensation for us? So there's another question about whether you could join up these trusts. And so a proportion of that money went to elsewhere. Uh, I'm not de-emphasizing the problem, but there's no ready-made place, which, excuse me, which is doing it, doing it all. And I thought somebody's question might be, what did I spill on my <laughs> jumper this morning? It's yogurt. It's okay if you really want to know. So I'm sorry. There we go. <laughs> it's terrible when you only realize it halfway through your talk. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I can get over that. All right. Any other questions? Uh, or observations. I mean, I'd love to get your, just, well, yeah. Here comes the dark cloud. No, okay. no I, I definitely <laughs> didn't mean my question to be uh, be um, <laughs> dark or anything. Um, actually, uh, what I heard from your answer is that we need to um, to formulate um, a future that we all buy into or we can we all agree to. Uh, that's what we call a common known, a uh, common future or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. I, I don't know the English translation for mm. it. But we are actually in, in our academy, we are going to make a mission lab on circular economy. Yeah. And so the, the um, and that is to, to formulate a mission that we all can buy into. So I think that's, uh, I, I hear your answer is that we need to, to formulate a mission yeah. uh, on the circular economy. So why, yeah. why I, I asked my question uh, was because we are collecting uh, actors that uh, wants to, um, to change our system so we can move into a more circular economy. Mm. So I was actually fishing a little bit to good ideas to actors, that interesting actors uh, that uh, wants to drive mm. this change. Mm. Um, to give some inspiration, I, uh, I talked to a professor in... Um, in the, the sweet, Swedish um, uh, Resilience Center. Mm -hmm. And he said that oh, yeah. some of the, 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 the um, best driving uh, forces when you make, wants to make a change is actually uh, people on the ground. Mm. It's uh, the NGOs mm. who are, uh, and it's the, the Greta Thunberg mm, and yeah. so on who wants to, make, wants to make a change. And then you see institutions and politicians uh, follow when you see these public um, revolutions. Yes, and it's, it's always, and it's, uh, if you're looking at the way that Danella Meadows described points of leverage in a system, the most effective one is to, around mindset and paradigm. In other words, a new narrative about how things should be, because this is engages people, just as the, the more right-leaning people are desperate, they feel, preyed upon, they feel they want somebody to protect them. They don't care about law and order so much as long as it's for them. In other words, they're economically, emotionally insecure. If you can offer something, that's why I played with the UB Universal Basic Dividend, that adds economic security to people's life and has a, a social, natural justice element to it. It could be, this is what the writers in Universal Basic Dividend say, and because we slightly distance it from government, it could be an idea that catches, and it also completely reinforces a circular economy. Because you will know from your work, and many people here will, one of the biggest problems is that prices don't tell the truth. Now, Universal Basic Dividend deals with both of those things. 
It increases economic security and it helps make prices tell the truth so that business models in the circular economy are more competitive. And it also helps local production and consumption because it says if r fuel prices are paid at a real level, stuff shipped in from abroad won't be as competitive as it used to be. Therefore, people working in, should we not call it a community, but a community and above, will be more competitive. So it's a natural fit, if you like. And the point I'd like to sort of make to you as somebody working on a, on a, on a hub or a development project is, one, it's about system conditions these days. We've had lots of experience with different business models. They don't work if there is no real system conditions that enable them to work. And the second thing, so it's often about economic changes, the, the second thing is that we need to be able to, and well, it's, it's a related one, we need to be able to make the, the money cycle work in the same way. It has to be distributive by design. Because there's lots of people with great ideas who think, I could try this startup, but I can only pay the rent for three months and then it all explodes. Whereas with a reasonable basic dividend, you could say, well, I can chill out about this. I can work on it with my friends because we're not going to go bust. We can, you know, it gives space and time to think creatively and for people to go, that's a really great idea. I want to do something similar. And the last point about the basic dividend is that giving people time to think things through because they're not in such an economically insecure position if, if this is done done right so that's why i'm talking about an expansion of the circular economy of beyond products components and materials into systems conditions for the economy particularly how money 80 in britain 80 percent of bank lending is to real estate and assets what you know that just reinforces the asset bubble we're all suffering from, so that younger folks can't afford the housing, for example, and businesses are, are starved of money because banks don't want to invest in them. So you've got many system conditions, I would say, that need to be pushed in place, and that's why I'm thinking, for me, obviously I've got a vested interest in a way because I've been writing about this, a universal basic dividend supports fully the circular economy it gives something people to understand and get a hold of. You know, it's pretty intuitive. And it helps the, the circular economy in a practical sense, not just in the, the business sense, but adds to the potential for local and regional production. And in consequence, it helps with democracy. Because one of the things that people can't do if they feel stressed is get involved in community decisions. You know, in Britain, the classic thing is that well-off middle-class people in the countryside have plenty of time to talk with all their neighbours about what might be going wrong and trying, you know, let's have a different form of shop. Whereas lots of other people are thinking, my God, I can't pay the bills. And so I think it's got some energy in terms of a narrative <laughs> linchpin. It's not the whole thing. A narrative linchpin, you call it, or central point to bring the changes you want because it encourages a reinforcing narrative at different levels. It's very pro-democracy, it's very anti-rentier, it, it talks about local and regional production, it, it helps with the environment thing, very, very importantly, and it helps with the social justice thing. So, for me, it's a way of leveraging thinking in this direction without... See, too often the circular economy has just been about products, components and materials. Hey, get on with it which is okay to some level, but it misses. Is that okay? What do you think? What, what do you think of the story? <laughs> I'm trying to sell you a story, you know, that's what yeah, I mean. Yeah, yeah, Have yeah. you bought my story yet? Have you bought it? <laughs> you will. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you will. But it might not be this story. That's where I want to sort of end with in a, in a sense. It might not be this story, but it will be the narratives and stories that we tell each other, which will get, will generate this change. Because that enthuses people and they go, I want to get involved in this. You liked my book because it mixed fiction and economic commentary. I think it allowed you a way into some of the thinking. Mm -hmm. Whereas many people go, what's Ken writing this wonderful Circles of Oz thing? Which is a take on the Wizard of Oz but applied to economies. The original thing was actually. But people go, why are you doing that? You're, you're supposed to be an academic-y thingy type person. But no, it's because I wanted to share narratives about work. 
And it shows that people are not there yet at all. Because people go, oh, it's a nice book. Mm. <laughs> now, I've got a project to run. What can you tell me about that? You know, we don't always get rewarded for having uh, narratives to play with. They'd rather say, how do we make cement more <laughs> eco-friendly? Or, you know, this is a perfectly valid thing. Or how do we, what do we do about plastic packaging? It's good. But I think we're at a stage where we need the narratives as well. Right? And I think we proved it a bit in the Ellen MacArthur Foundation by doing a synthesis of existing ideas and saying, maybe this narrative's good for these times. I I'm pushing my luck a bit there, I know. But. Are there any more questions or comments? Otherwise, I can try and uh, phrase what's flying around in my brain. Yeah. Um, because... Last week, I think, I was actually listening in on a presentation about the donut, donut economics by yeah. Kay Rayworth. Kay Rayworth. And yeah. in combination with what I've heard from you today, I kind of had the question that I see, I understand the donut economics and kind of that idea behind it. And I see at the same time our current society, which is still, yeah, based on consumerism, capitalism, economic growth measured by GDP, and there's a bit of a clash between the two. And I'm wondering if the models that also you presented today and the donut economics, is it like a way of changing where we are right now or is it where we want to go and we need to figure out the in-between? And I'm not, I'm not an economic, so that's maybe no. why I have a trouble seeing... Well, the, the essence of the what I do is very similar to Kate Rayworth in a way because it's based on understanding the world as systems she takes a complex systems approach. Old-fashioned economics is very mechanistic. It's like old-fashioned 19th century physics. You know, X marks the spot. That's where's the supply and demand cross. It's proven. Mm. No, it isn't. So we have both share this idea that we got to use systems thinking. And if you're thinking about interdependent, complex systems, all I've done, not all, but I've tried to draw out, well, what structures exist in these systems? And could that help justify the very thing she wants to chase with the donut economics, which is a balance between resilience and efficiency. In other words, I'm providing a bit of theoretical background rather than just, this is a good thing, right? which we understand. The, I've often said to Kate, I, I think you're a little short on the money side. You know, you don't really discuss those cycles. And she does discuss it, but not enough for me. But the, the key element is, do you want to transition in other words, you want to perhaps use a circular economy to have a better world, but with not really changing who's in charge. Mm -hmm. That's where the, the uh, asset management thing comes in. Or do you want it to be a force for changing how we think about the economy and who's responsible for what? You do have to have a theory behind it. And I'm trying to use the theory of system structures mm -hmm. and uh, ideas that we need to take economic rents, which are unearned income, and give them as unearned income you know there's a sort of simplicity to that rather than taxing people we tax economic rents and then circulate because it's all about circulation and preserving capitals isn't it Kate's totally on that mm -hmm. so it's a similar direction she works more in the detail of the social justice element and getting things practically done in terms of initiatives in the donut economics action lab and so on I'm more of a slightly at a distance from that Mm -hmm. Not because I'm not very socially skilled, okay? But, you know, you, you, you do have to know your own strengths and weaknesses. So we're not identical, but we move. I work more with the economic theory around some of these changes. I'll put it that way. She works in a much more practical sense in a lot of projects. And you need both. I hope so, or I haven't got a job. You know. <laughs> All right. I think that's our time's up now. So thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for asking great questions. Yeah. And if you're lucky, Ken might stick around a bit. I'm going to stick around a little bit, yeah. Just have have a, at least grab beverage. another coffee. And for you online, thank you for joining as well. It was a pleasure. And by this, we'll end this year's series yeah. of Science Yeah, and you can find Club. me on LinkedIn, ken.w, for some reason. I don't know why it doesn't say Webster. But I'm on LinkedIn if you want to connect or throw more questions in. Just, I love it. Okay. Yes, Thanks thank very you very much. much. Thank you. Um,